So a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining Cop Talk. I'm Ashwini, a PhD student in Cognitive Science at the Center for Neural and Cognitive Sciences, University of Hyderabad, and also the student coordinator for this lecture series. I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Danva for accepting our invitation in spite of his very busy schedule. Thank you, sir. Uh, to share a few things about him, he is currently a professor of evolutionary psychology at University of Oxford. He works on behavioral, cognitive, and neuroendocrinological underpinnings of forming social bonds with an aim of understanding how we evolved to be the social animal that we are. He's well known for his Dunbar's number, the cognitive limit number of individuals with whom one can maintain stable relationships. He has written around 20 books and has published more than 300 articles in the field, which speaks for the expanse of his knowledge and expertise. In this talk, he will be speaking about the new anatomy of friendship introducing us to how we use behavioral, cognitive, and neurobiological basis to build friendship and form social communities. Also, kindly allow me to introduce our moderator, Professor Ramesh Kumar Mishra, who is the chair at the Center for Neural and Cognitive Sciences and also the mentor for CogTalk. His work is aimed at understanding the control processes underpinning the prime aspects of cognition, such as visual attention, consciousness, and bilingualism, and answering questions about individual differences arising in such processes. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I will now invite Professor Mishra to speak a few words. Uh, thank you, Aswini, and uh, thank you, Professor Dunba, for really you know, giving us some time. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an occasion to celebrate because we never got earlier a chance to speak with the Star Wars and COVID uh, sort of made it possible. And I hope that we continue this hybrid mode of interaction to, to really reach out to people. So I, uh, I just bring in Cherry uh, University of Hyderabad, which is a research university in central India, in the iconic city of Hyderabad. <coughs> And we are uh, very much interested uh, in expanding our origins in many dimensions in new territories. So from that point of view, Talk Talk represents a forum where we have had the chance to really talk to very excellent uh, talk leaders from various uh, disciplines. Please uh, have a look at the website. And uh, <clears throat> we as the center are interested in neural cognitive science. It's obviously a question of the mind, the brain, and uh, other things. The question of evolution is certainly a very uh, um, important point. But although I must note that in India, I haven't come across any systematic work from the psychological or neurobiological side on the question of evolution, particularly the evolution of uh, higher cognition or uh, the social dimensions of the social cognition. Some of the things that I personally I have been interested in, and I hope that I will learn uh, something today. So I thank the audience who have been with us for, for a very long time and the students. So the, uh, the way we go is that, you know, it's uh, the speaker would uh, deliver presentation uh, and then I would ask some questions and the audience also can ask some questions. And we have to keep time in mind, although it gets very fascinated as we move on and we have to keep in time and we'll see that we are uh, doing it. So with these words, I again uh, welcome Professor Dunba, a really uh, a, a famous name in uh, evolutionary sciences and uh, uh, who needs no introduction. Um, and I think uh, he, he uh, students who are watching or who later watch these videos, we update on the university website as well for other people who could not join to see and follow, follow it up. Um, <laughs> would be influenced and would be able to integrate uh, his ideas. And the community that we have here as students from psychology, neuroscience, uh, other related things, philosophy, so they would be suddenly able to you know, integrate. And, uh, uh, so. so let's, uh, Professor Dunbar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, very nice to be in the 
Well, you're right. The very historical and iconic city of Hyderabad, even if only virtually. But uh, hopefully one day I can actually come and uh, visit there. Um, let me just call up my slides here. Uh, I, I'm going to talk mainly about um, uh, the nature of um, friendships and how they're kind of organized, if you like, but it's um, quite wide ranging uh, and draws on the many different kinds of research that I do, which is both uh, studying animals and particularly primates in the wild, on the one hand, um, to some extent humans in their natural habitat, uh, as well uh, it, um, in cities or wherever they happen to live, but also spanning through to um, uh, neuroimaging and, uh, and uh, neurobiology of friendship. So it's a, it's a kind of uh, very multidisciplinary in this sense, um, because it, 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 in terms of just psychology, it, it draws on social psychology as well as um, cognitive and experimental and, and um, uh, neuropsychology. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, let me just start by reminding you um, of something I'm sure you're all uh, fully aware of, uh, it, at least intuitively from your everyday life, just how important your friendships are to you. And I, I use the term friend here uh, in a very general sense, meaning your close social relationships. So it includes family, extended family, even your in-laws, um, as well as the people we would normally consider to be uh, friends. Let's say people we're not necessarily biologically related to. Uh, I think one of the big surprises of the last 15 years, maybe not a, not a lot more than that, certainly, has been the huge amount of evidence that suddenly appeared showing that the single best predictor of your psychological health and well-being, your physical health and well-being, even how long you're going to live into the future, is simply the number and quality of close friendships that you have, whether those are family members or, or friends in the usual sense of the word. Uh, and here's one of those um, studies that actually it's, it's a meta-analysis, a compilation of about 150 different um, medical epidemiological uh, studies and surveys uh, of mortality, um, uh, factors that uh, uh, influence mortality. And the focus here in these data is uh, what is it that best predicts your chances of surviving 12 months after your first heart attack? So this is a very hard nose. The reason I like this study, it's very hard nosed, right? The outcome variable is, did you die or did you survive for 12 months? Uh, you can't argue with this. So it's very different to the usual kinds of studies uh, in sociology and medical epidemiology and uh, social psychology where questionnaires are given out and people rate perhaps their happiness or something like that and of course these work very well considering but but there's a lot of kind of error variance in there. It's, the data are a bit sloppy here <clears throat> the outcome variable is really hard nosed and what uh, this particular study shows is that all the things that your friendly neighborhood doctor worries about on your behalf how much exercise you take how much alcohol you drink whether you smoke or not uh, how obese you are, what drug treatment you're on, uh, what the air quality where you live is like, um, uh, and all these kinds of things. They're not unimportant. They make a contribution. But the contribution they make is relatively small compared to the single effect of the quality and number of close friendships that you have. Uh, second only to that is giving up smoking. Um, <clears throat> but otherwise, these, these other things that uh, the medical professions tend to worry about kind of fade into second place some distance behind. And, and we have now a huge amount of data from uh, wild uh, populations of wild animals, uh, of baboons, of chimpanzees, of um, uh, macaques uh, 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 from various parts of South Asia, of wild horses and of fins very very similar effects the uh survival chances the longevity how long an individual female lives uh, how 
many offspring she has, her reproductive rate, uh, how likely her babies are to survive to adulthood themselves, um, how quickly she recovers from an injury if she, she's injured but in some, some way. All these things are very strongly predicted by how many close friends she has in all these uh, majorly social uh, mammal species. So it's not necessarily all mammals or even birds, it's the species of mammals that are intensely social, mainly the primates, of course, but also some of these other species like horses and dolphins. So <clears throat> that you might think um, gives you an excuse to have an infinite number of friends, maybe. That, that, uh, uh, your initial hypothesis might be that um, the more friends you can have, uh, the be longer you're going to live and the happier you're going to be. And indeed, I, I might add that um, one of the other sets of data that uh, bear on this is just basic social psychology data looking at how satisfied you are with your life, how happy you are, uh, how depressed you've been recently, um, uh, how well you're embedded into your local community, how much you trust the people around you. All these are also predicted by the number and quality of close friendships you have. So the question is, is there a limit on the number of friends you can have? And uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you, there's a very severe limit. Uh, and that severe limit comes out of this effect. This is known as the social brain hypothesis. It was originally proposed nearly 30 years ago now as an explanation for why monkeys and apes have such large brains, much larger than other species of mammals and birds. And the suggestion was that it was because they live in much more complex societies. So they need a bigger computer, if you like, to manage all the relationships that are involved in these complex societies. So these are the basic data that <clears throat> um, I actually originally produced to support that hypothesis. The hypothesis itself is not my hypothesis, uh, but it's a plot of group size in various monkeys and apes uh, and other primates plotted against a measure of the brain. Originally I used neocortex ratio because, which is the ratio of the neocortex to the rest of the brain, like the subcortical brain. Um, but in fact, it turns out that almost any measure of brain size or brain part size um, will give you the same result. Um, although the, the, the result is kind of more messy if you use total brain size, because obviously that, that then includes bits of the brain that are just doing mechanistic physiological processing rather than social processing, social cognition processing. Um, <clears throat> and it gets the, the lines or the regressions, if you like, in the data get sharper and sharper if you narrow the part of the brain down towards the, the frontal end, the, the uh, prefrontal cortex in that direction. But anyway, these are the original data. We thought they were just a single data set, um, <clears throat> but it turns out, in fact, they consist of four really quite distinct grades. Um, uh, and you can see that these are highlighted here by the alternating uh, unfilled and filled um, uh, symbols here just to uh, sh uh, show you how tightly these fit around their grade lines. As you go across from left to right across these four grades, um, you get increasing levels of bondedness in the social system. It's one of the characteristics of primate social systems and indeed the social systems of dolphins and horses and other species like elephants. They have these very intense bonded relationships which have produced very stable relationships which can last an entire lifetime. They're very much like our uh, friendships and family relationships. <clears throat> it's increased uh, social complexity as you go across in, in terms of the structure of the social groups as you go from left to right. Um, and also uh, we can show that there's increasing cognitive, um, <clears throat> quantitatively increasing cognitive complexity or sophistication. Um, uh, the animal, the species gets smarter <coughs> as you go from left to right. Um, so what does uh, the social brain hypothesis predict for humans? Well, humans belong to the great apes. Um, which is this line on the extreme right here. Uh, these are the uh, orangutan and the gorilla here, the gibbons uh, down here, chimpanzees up here. And that's in fact uh, humans. 
if you plug our uh, neocortex ratio into the regression line for the great apes, you get a predicted value of about 150. That's the number that's now known as Dunbar's number. So that appears to be the limit on the natural size of social groups for humans that's comparable to the size of social groups in our cousins, if you like, the other monkeys and apes. So the question is, is this really true or are social groups really so small? Um, the answer is yes, uh, we now have really um, masses of data showing this, sometimes from extremely large samples. So here's one data set which was uh, produced off the back of a national set. So it's uh, about 20% of an entire country, South European country, um, about 6 million subscribers. Um, all the calls they made over a period of a, a year, so it's something like 6 billion calls. And uh, what we did was we uh, first we cleaned the data and remove all the kind of um, commercial numbers that, that you inevitably get in there, the free, free numbers and, and ones that are identifiable as commercial numbers by the um, uh, dialing codes for, for that country. And then <clears throat> we get what uh, we look for, um, reciprocated calls. So we define a, a friendship in this general sense some of which, of course, may be family relationships, but we define a friendship as, as a case where two people both call each other. So A calls B and later B calls A back. If, if, if one person calls another number and that number never calls back, we don't count that. So if you take this measure of the number of friends uh, that the person has or relationships the person has, you get a distribution that looks like this. Notice the x-axis here is the log scale, so the uh, true distribution is a peak here with a very, very long tail out to the right, uh, uh, going out to some fairly large numbers. But the, the, media, um, the mean and the mode here are very close together at around about 145. So that's pretty close to um, uh, 150. Uh, and for, just to give you a sense of some of the other kinds of data that we have <clears throat> at the top here are the size of... Uh, of um, uh, wedding groups in um, the USA, uh, uh, there's a database that's collated uh, the number of people invited to weddings over a decade timescale now, and the average there is 145. I'm very conscious that um, 145 is a very small wedding by Indian standards, but um, either this means Americans don't have many friends and family, or, or they're just being... Um, uh, more selective or just more mean, I'm not sure which, you'd make your pick. Um, but the average there is 145, and that looks to us like their core set of family and close friendships. They're not inviting the sort of distant members <clears throat> of their community so much. Uh, if you look at the size of hunter-gatherer clans, um, <clears throat> such as Bushmen in Southern Africa, or indeed we have uh, included in here some of the uh, hunter-gatherer uh, societies that still exist in, in South Asia. Um, the average uh, is about 155. There are two or three very nice data sets for village sizes um, in Europe. One is the Doomsday Book, which um, the Normans, when they conquered England from France in uh, 1066, carried out this massive census of the whole country to find out what they got for themselves by conquering England. Um, so it's a very, very good record of every single village, how many houses are in the village, uh, how many cows, how many plows, absolutely everything was counted. And the historians have worked out that the average village size was, was very close to 150. Um, there's now a, some very good data from uh, English church record books of baptisms and marriages and deaths which the historians have worked out what the village sizes are in, and these start from about the 1750s uh, upwards and certainly at the end of the 18th century when it was still a very small scale society in, in, in Europe, um, <clears throat> very few large cities, um, in fact probably in England the only large city was, was, was London. Um, uh, the average village size, again, was still about 150. And then there's a nice Italian data set of, uh, with a 600-year time span of village sizes in the Alps, 
uh, rural population from about 1250 AD right the way through to about 1850 AD. It's a very long time span and village size remains very close to, to um, 160 or so. So overall, these three data sets give us an average about historical average of about 160. And lastly, we look at the size of modern armies. They all base around companies as the fundamental unit. Um, uh, uh, and all over the world, the average size of that unit, it's the smallest unit that can stand on its own two feet independently, um, is uh, about 160. It varies a bit from, uh, I think the British Army is about 120 officially. Uh, the American Army, uh, from the current manuals, these are it, uh, have a company size of about 180, and then pretty much everybody else fits in between <clears throat> that, that range. So here's a sense in which groupings of humans, but also the uh, uh, sort of natural grouping size of humans, but also their uh, picture of their social relationships uh, gives us very much the same sort of figure, somewhere about 150 people. So the usual question I get asked at this point is, um, <clears throat> well, I'm on Facebook and I have uh, 2000 friends on Facebook. Uh, surely Facebook has made a big difference. And the answer is, well, it might have done because one of the things Facebook has clearly done, or indeed any of the other major social networking sites, is allowed you to keep up with your friends when they move away. So when you can't walk around down the street and go and knock on their door and say, come on, let's go and have a lassie somewhere or uh, something like that, uh, you can still keep up with them and still uh, maintain your friendship over time. And, and you can do it with more people simultaneously because again, uh, when we are normally engaged with our friendships and creating and maintaining our friendships, we're doing this in very, very small groups, two or three people maybe only. Um, uh, and that's because it's based around conversation. Actually. And obviously on, on Facebook, you can uh, post a message and, and the whole world can read it. Maybe it's not restricted. Uh, so we had some interest in this context as to whether digital media had allowed us to increase our natural grouping size? And the answer is no. These are data from Stephen Wolf Wolfram's analyses of uh, Facebook data. It's a million Facebook pages. It's from dates from about 2008, I think. Uh, and what you see here is the classic pictures, very much like our telephone data set. You've got this very big peak here, somewhere over here, with a long tail out to, to, to the right here, but pretty much nothing to speak of just a very small number of people after about 2000 and really not many people after about a thousand um and in fact he said the mode was somewhere between about 150 and 250 that's the most common value at that peak which would be about right because most facebook users are younger generation people teenagers and 20 somethings and they tend to have more than 150 so it's a very strong age effect around dunbar's number um, I, might, I might add, actually, there's a, a somewhat infamous uh, study that was uh, published in Nature in about 2012, I think it was. Um, uh, it was nothing to do with this per se, but they, they sampled uh, 61 million Facebook pages and uh, they give a figure of 149 uh, as the average number of friends on those 61 million Facebook pages. So I think on the strength of that study alone, I can... Um, uh, say thank you very much and retire to live on a yacht in the Caribbean, um, having been proved right, I think. So the question is, what imposes the limit? Clearly it has something to do with the brain. So it's probably been uh, in the order of, uh, well, probably actually now, probably about 25 neuroimaging studies that have been published, um, uh, showing relation correlations between the number of friends people have listed um, measured in various different ways, some by, by using number of friends on Facebook, some by use, asking people to list out all their friends, which is how we did our original studies, uh, which is very laborious. Uh, others uh, asking them how many close friends they have in a particular um, uh, quality of relationship to them. Um, but always you get the same answer, um, that the size of your friendship circle is related to what was originally known as the 
mentalizing uh, um, network in the brain, which is primarily a bunch of um, uh, uh, prefrontal cortex units up, up in here, um, uh, a temporoparietal junction back here on, on the end of the parietal lobe, and something up here in the temporal lobe, by the temporal pole or the um, uh, superior temporal sul uh, sulcus. And th these things appear to be strongly linked together. Um, it, it's, uh, and, and that sort of um, was how everybody saw it because these mentalizing capacities are clearly very important in how we manage relationships. Indeed, we've shown with our data that your mentalizing abilities, your abilities to understand somebody else's perspective, to understand what they're thinking and why they're doing something, what's motivating them, uh, correlates with the number of friends you have. It correlates with the size of this uh, so big circuit here and with the size of your so personal social group. Um, this now turns out to, to effectively be the default mode neural network, ironically. So the default mode neural network is not something that kicks into place when you're doing nothing, which is what the original um, name came from. But actually, <clears throat> when the brain is free to think about social relationships, <coughs> either because it's daydreaming um, or because it's actively involved in managing social relationships, then uh, it's this huge, massive uh, neural circuit linking these three primary areas that seems to be uh, involved in managing uh, relationships. Not a memory problem, it's, it's about predicting how other people behave, essentially. Um, and it also now, it, it's clear, involves this loop down from the frontal lobes um, or the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, down into the limbic system and, and perhaps beyond, so into the amygdala and maybe other areas like hippocampus and so on. So this is a huge component of the brain because the, the uh, white matter um, uh, neural uh, circuitry that connects these areas is absolutely huge. That's essentially the default mode network. Um, <clears throat> but as I say, now there's a very large number of studies showing that, that um, this huge circuit, and it explains the reason it's so big, or the fact that it's so big clearly explains why we, we get um, uh, these correlations between the brain more or less however we measure it, because this is a massive part of the um, neocortex and, and the sub, some of the subcortical uh, units as well. Um, so it explains the original results we have quite nicely. Now, what's kind of interesting is that there have now been three studies published, um, one for uh, captive macaques, one for wild living macaques in the Caribbean, a big population uh, on Puerto Rico, um, one of the islands of Puerto Rico, um, and for um, baboons living in captivity, but in large enclosures where they've measured... Uh, um, size of brains or the size of this same circuit uh, and showed that it correlates with the size of individuals groups. So the social brain hypothesis works both at a species level and at the individual level. And what's interesting about this massive circuit here, and particularly the frontal lobes, prefrontal cortex up here and the frontal pole in particular in here, um, Brodmann areas nine and 10, is that they appear to be required for mentalizing, mind reading, for uh, self-control or inhibition, uh, for causal reasoning, for uh, being able to com compare two alternative strategies into the future and decide which is the best, for analogical reasoning uh, in monkey snakes. And this area in particular, this, this um, uh, problem area 10 in particular here, only occurs in anthropoid primates. Other, other species of mammals and uh, birds don't have it. And it appears to underpin both the smartness of primates generally, or monkeys and apes generally, it doesn't apply to prosimians, um, but also their intense social capacity. And here's this, I, I just highlight this paper down here by Quack et al. Uh, from Korea. I think they get the, um, they get the, the, the silver spoon for, for the best study of the lot, I think, because they not only surveyed an entire village in Korea, uh, but they then used not how does each person, who does each person think um, uh, they're friends with, but they used whether 
how many people said you are their friend so they they did it in reverse in a much more hard-nosed way and then they went around and imaged a very large number of these long-suffering uh people in, in, in this village and you can see these areas appearing again here on the left hand one you've got the um essentially the temporal uh, temporal lobe here the pr um, um, uh, um, uh, temporal parietal junction up here and the frontal lobes up here dorsal uh, prefrontal cortex and, and and down here on the edge of the the medial prefrontal cortex in um, problem area 10-ish that sort of area so all this seems to come together very nicely i think so the question then is there you are with your 150 friends and family but are they all worth the same to you do does your family relationships look like the picture on the left um uh, which comes obviously from some uh, concert pop concert somewhere um where people most people don't know anybody <clears throat> they're just all together for the for the pop concert for the music or does it look like this picture down here where it, much more clumpy where you have close friends and distant friends uh, the answer is it looks like the second and, and here's just some of our data uh, showing this it's the from our, again our telephone data set from uh, mobile phone data set um, and, and what this essentially shows is that if you look at the frequencies with which people contact each other fo phone each other then it turns out there are quite distinct layers there are, with very distinct numbers of individuals in each layer um, and those layers look a bit like this uh, in size these are the average sizes of the layers that emerge from um, the cell phone data set here but we've also uh, done this for facebook data sets and old facebook data sets publicly available uh, for twitter data looking at people talking to each other within twitter accounts uh, name name discussions going on and also our face-to-face -face data and you can see how closely these numbers match up so it looks like there are four or five major divisions that can be made into uh, of your friends and family as it were a very small number that you uh, devote a lot of time to uh, call them very regularly um, uh, these numbers are inclusive by the way so, so this uh, layer of about five people includes this layer here um, uh, and so on, um, a, a group of about five slightly less intense relationships, and then there's 50 and 50, and finally the 150. And it turns out that these numbers match very, very closely indeed the distribution of primate group size. So if you look at the sizes of primate groups across all the species of primates, they tend to have these numbers. So they're either very small, uh, of about two, two and a half uh, animals, perhaps, so monogamous pairs, maybe. Um, <clears throat> um, actually, no, these are more semi-solitary. Uh, these will tend to be monogamous pairs, so things like gibbons, uh, there'll be a male and a female, and some offspring. And then you have small harem species. Uh, I think of some of the leaf monkeys, um, perhaps uh, things like that. And then you've got a group that have groups of about 50, 40 to 50 in size, you think of macaques, um, the langort monkey, um, uh, species like that, um, that have these bigger groups, chimpanzees are in, in this group here. And, uh, and of course, they don't have numbers of 150, it's only humans that do. So these numbers match up very, very tightly uh, in a remarkable way. And indeed, now uh, we've looked at the internal structure of primate groups, particularly in these large grouping species here, like chimpanzees and so on, and show that the internal structuring of these groups looks exactly like this in humans. So we do what all our monkey and ape cousins do, we just do it bigger and better, if you like. So your social world really looks like this. Um, you're sitting in the center of this set of circles, you have a small group of about one and a half kind of very intimate friends, a group of about five uh, close friends, you can put numbers on these if you like, um we often call this this group size of five here the close friends the shoulders to cry on friends so typically they'd be two family members two friends in the usual sense and, and just one more from either side and these are the people who will drop everything uh, to come and help you uh when there's, there's a disaster in your life and it runs out through to the 150 then we know this sequence carries on beyond that 
Um, outside the 150, there's a layer 500, which we can think of as acquaintances, people you know, you work with many of these people, but you probably wouldn't invite them home to your big party. Um, uh, whereas the 150 is your core uh, sort of once in a lifetime big party event uh, kind of um, thing, like a, a marriage maybe, at least in Europe. Um, uh, and then beyond that, uh, there's a layer at 1500, which is the number of faces we can put names to. So I'm sorry to have to tell you that probably sitting in that 1500, for all of us, you and me together, um, is Donald Trump. Um, whether you like him or you don't like him, is, it doesn't matter. The point is, if you saw him in the street, you would know who he was. He wouldn't know who you are, but you would recognize him. So you can put a name the name to his face. Um, and beyond that is one more layer that runs out to 5,000, which some uh, uh, vision uh, psychologists discovered by accident, I think, um, which is the number of people who's, if we see that a photograph of their face, we know whether we've seen them before or not. So it's the difference between strangers and people we vaguely know that we've seen in the past. And that appears to be the end of it because beyond 5,000, it's totally anonymous. Um, so the difference between inside the red circle and the names outside really amounts to the time you give them. Uh, you give much more time to these people in the center here. You give about 40% of your total social capital, social, social effort and time to these five people in the middle. You give a very small amount only to these people here and very little to the people beyond that. Outside the red line, for the people inside the red line, the 150, you will be uh, willing to be to help them out. And if they ask you to uh, uh, lend them some money or to come and help help them with something, you'll probably do it. Um, outside that 150, you'll probably want some guarantee that they'll pay you back or they'll reimburse you for your time. So it becomes much more transactional outside that 150. So how do we create our friendships within that 150 in that case? Uh, well, we do it the same way as monkeys and apes do it. And monkeys and apes is based on a two process mechanism, a dual process mechanism, which will be familiar probably to psychologists. Uh, the mechanism that involves two different neural processes which act in tandem with each other in parallel. One of them is an emotionally intense component. That's the stuff here, grooming. Uh, the other is a much more cognitive component <clears throat> that involves brain size and the kinds of cognition that I've talked about, mentalizing and so on. And what seems to happen is this, this, this involves the endorphin system in the brain primarily. Um, <clears throat> uh, it sets up a psychopharmacological platform, uh, or, which underpins bondedness really, and makes you feel emotionally close and trusting of the, the person you do these activities with. And that allows you to build this cognitive relationship, a relationship of trust and obligation and reciprocity. So it's very time dependent. Um, and indeed, some of these species, I and mean, this species here, the gelato baboon from Ethiopia, spends nearly 20% of its entire day uh, grooming like this. Um, but it lives in very, very big groups. These are Japanese macaques. Um, they spend something in the order of about 12 or 15% of their entire day. So that's many hours. Uh, grooming. And just to show you that it works in humans too, even though we don't have any fur, um, these are a PET scanning experiment run by my collaborators in Finland, um, where they um, had uh, a number of people go into the um, scanner um, and they were stroked by their girlfriend. So all the subjects were men and um, uh, we had their girlfriends come and just stroke them gently uh, over the surface of the chest and, and, and abdomen, no, not above the neck or, or below the belt, if you like. <clears throat> and here's the brain uh, just showing the endorphin receptors going absolutely wild as a consequence of this. This is com comparing <clears throat> before being stroked with, with after being stroked or while being stroked. And of course, you know, what, what's happened is that what, well, what causes this system to work is the stroking of the hand through the fur uh, as they part the fur to, to look for bits of vegetation and so on beneath it. 
uh, triggers a sp very specialized neural system in the skin, the uh, C tactile, affer afferent C tactile neural system, uh, which goes, is, is a very peculiar system. It, it's unmyelinated, so it's very slow. It has no return motor loop from the brain, just sends signals straight to the brain um, where it triggers eventually the endorphin system. It goes into the insula and not the association cortex as such and triggers the endorphin system through that. And here it is being triggered. And of course, we do a lot of this stuff all the time. We're hugging and patting and uh, stroking people. Uh, uh, and if you want to get a good feel for um, uh, the endorphin system being kicked off by, by what's essentially grooming, well, just go to your barber and uh, have a long hairdressing session and, and you will feel it. <coughs> um, what's interesting about the endorphin system is not only being opiates, they give you this sense of warmth and relaxation and calmness and exhilaration and trust in the person you're doing it with, but they also trigger the immune system, uh, natural killer cells to be pumped out, um, which may explain why you get this effect between friendship and um, uh, health and longevity. It's not so much the friends, but what the friends do with you that seems to be important. It's triggering the endorphin system. The endorphin system is providing you with these, this mechanism for protecting you against uh, things like viruses and ca even cancer cells. The natural killer cells <coughs> target viruses and, and some cancers in particular. So why is time important? It's because at least with friends, not true of families so much, but at least with friends, if you don't see the person regularly, the quality of the emotional quality of the friendship just falls away very quickly. It's one of our longitudinal studies. Um, we have plotted here the change in emotional closeness over an um, 18 month period um, uh, to all the members of your extended family and all your friends averaged out and these people moved away from home at about this stage. They, they, they were all uh, high school students going to university at this point. This is the first year at university meeting new people. You see, they're old friends. This is the uh, emotional closeness or uh, change in emotional closeness to their original friends in the, their last six months at school. And you can see it just drops away very, very fast uh, by not seeing them. And herein lies the problem because Grooming in particular, and the kinds of things we do with our close friends is very, A, very time consuming, occupies a lot of time, because uh, you have to invest in each person for a certain amount of time to create a relationship of, of a particular strength. But also, um, <clears throat> its intimacy means we can't do it with several people at once. So it's really a one-on-one -on -one activity. And when humans moved into having very much bigger uh, groups than other the monkey's name so we went past the group size of 50 barrier towards 150 they needed something else that would allow them to trigger the same mechanism the same bonding mechanism without having to do it physically um face to face if you like in person and what we seem to have done is discovered that these various activities here all trigger the endorphin system so the oldest of these is laughter which we share with the great apes that probably evolved in humans, the form humans have it around 2 million years ago. It's completely cross-cultural. It's very visceral. Okay, we use jokes to make people laugh, but if somebody laughs, we will laugh, even if we don't understand the joke. You can't help it. And then a bit later on came in singing and dancing, singing without words, so like chorusing or humming, that kind of thing. And then finally, the appearance of language, you open up other possibilities. So we have the rituals of religion, feasting, eating and drinking, um, particularly drinking alcohol seems to be a very good trigger of the endorphin system and telling stories, telling emotional stories, but also stories that there's kind of folk tales that, that every um, uh, culture enjoys. And we've shown that all of these uh, trigger the endorphin system. All of them make you feel more bonded when that happens. And it creates a sense of, it allows us to groom virtually with very, very large numbers of people. Some of them have uh, size limits, but others don't. Singing appears to be, we can have as many people as we like, or religious services, we can have as many people as we like, uh, um, uh, uh, at least within the range of hundreds, uh, and everybody feels that they belong to the community. Just to show you some of the data for that, here's our 
some of our, our studies for the laughter. So what we're doing is we're using a pain threshold uh, test. Uh, how uh, long can you stand a doctor's uh, um, blood pressure sleeve blown up on your arm? Um, we assay your, your, your pain threshold or, uh, uh, or pain tolerance, you might prefer to call it. We give you some activity like a video that makes you laugh. And then we test your pain threshold again. If, if the endorphins have been produced, pain thresholds will increase across that gap because endorf the primary function of endorphins is as part of the pain control mechanism. It's an opiate. It does the same thing as opiate. If there's no endorphins, then there'll be no change. And these are um, a series of six studies we've done where people have watched uh, short clips of stand-up comedy. This is Michael McIntyre, very famous uh, British comedian and we, we have a control group with something like an instruction video um, which uh, people almost never laugh at um, and then when you look at these data these are five separate experiments uh, people who watch comedy and, and laugh uh, tend to show increased pain thresholds people who watch the control groups uh, or control stimulus had reduced or, or no change in the pain thresholds so zero means no change across um, the, the experimental condition um, uh, 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 and, and generally uh, the experimental people who are laughing uh, pain thresholds are always higher than those uh, who watch the control and our colleagues again in, in Finland have done a pet equivalent PET scanning study um, done exactly the same way um, <clears throat> and here are their, their essential results again you can see the, the brain just firing or the receptors for endorphins in the brain just firing up after uh, you've laughed. Um, so just to finish off, let me ask uh, who makes a good friend? And the answer seems to be uh, homophily, homophily, homophily. There's a famous uh, real estate uh, estate agent's mantra, which says, you know, what, uh, what makes a, a house valuable when you want to sell it? Well, it's location, location, location. So by the same analogy, what makes a good friend? Well, it's homophily, homophily, homophily. All our friends and family members, the ones we like best, uh, tend to be very similar to us. Now, some of these traits are endogenous. They are part of us that we can't do anything about. Some are exogenous. I'll just explain these very quickly. The endogenous traits are really things like gender. There's a very, very strong gender bias in friendships. About 75% of our friends for both sexes are the same sex of us. Uh, and that, that number, that value remains constant from about the age of five to about the age of 85. Loads and loads of studies showing this. And it's true for both sexes. These are data for women, uh, women's networks. Um, this is the proportion of women in there that they list in their, their friendship circles, 75% of females and only about 25% of men. Uh, age, a very strong age effects. Our friends tend to be the same age as us. Obviously, they're kind of parents and grandparents, <clears throat> uh, but they're kind of exceptional. <clears throat> and of course, we tend not to have too many parents and too many grandparents, or for that matter, aunts and uncles. Um, uh, the bulk of people in our social network, particularly the friends, tend to be roughly the same age as us. Ethnicity is a very, very strong effect. Again, that's measuring culture. We think all of these are really measuring culture and I'll come back to that in a second and finally personality extroverts prefer extroverts as friends introverts prefer introverts the exogenous traits come down to what we call the seven pillars of friendship um, uh, which um, uh, it, 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 you may recognize as a title stolen from the Quran in fact uh, from the seven pillars of wisdom um, via uh, Lawrence of Arabia um, but I thought it captured so nicely the, the, the essential concept here. That there are kind of seven dimensions to friendship, um, uh, all of which are quite different. So almost like a supermarket barcode, if you like, on your forehead. Um, but they're all cultural things. So there's like sharing the same language, especially the same dialect, because that identifies the village you come from, right? Uh, coming, growing up in the same place, because that identifies where you learned how to be a member of the community, having the same educational trajectory, uh, same career pathways, which explains why doctors tend to have doctors as friends. I dare say university lecturers tend to have university lecturers as friends. Uh, having the same hobbies and interests, the same moral, religious and political views all put together. 
under a, 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 a title of uh, your worldview, how you see, think the world works. And then the last two are particularly interesting, having the same musical taste and the same sense of humor. And the more of these you share with somebody, the stronger the relationship is, no matter whether it's a family relationship or a, a, a friendship. And, and these are data from one of our studies. So these are the number of shared traits. You, you share none at all, or you share five or six up here. And you can see the emotional closeness increases steadily as you share more and more traits. And I think that both these, now these are interesting because they change, a, you learn them, B, they change through life as you move from one community to another uh, in different parts of your life. But all of these, basically, including these ones here, are really identifying a kind of small, if you like, village community from which you come. It's the people who think in the same sort of way. You know how they think, you, you know how much you can trust them. You don't have to explain the joke to them. Uh, it's easy to have a conversation with them because you all share the same ideas and attitudes and so on. And, and that means you know how much you can trust them. Uh, you feel comfortable uh, with them. There's no ambiguity about relationships and so on. I think it's identifying the same very, very small 150 or so people. So just to sum up then, and I've probably talked for far too long, I'm afraid, um, the human social world is very, very small. Its size is determined by the size of our brain. Our social networks are highly structured and very homophilous. The structure is determined mainly by how we allocate time so as to maximize the benefits. Uh, friendships are underpinned then by this dual process mechanism involving endorphins, which is a time-based thing, plus the social cognition. And finally, cultural similarity, and emphasize the cultural similarity. That's why I use the term ethnicity here because um, it applies within, um, if you like, Europeans or within uh, South Asians. It's not just those big categories. It's very, very specific to local, local regional uh, differences. Uh, the seven pillars, these are extremely important. And you can find a lot of this stuff in this book of mine, which came out um, exactly a year ago. Paperback version is now available, just, just come out uh, last month, I think. So thank you very much. I uh, will stop sharing and um, return to uh, Professor Mishra here to. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Dunbar, for a really exciting uh, lecture. Obviously, people have intuitive ideas about friendship and what people go for, but they don't know the science behind it. That it's a it's some sort of a necessity. So I'd like to ask a couple of things, not directly related to the data. Um, I have a feeling that uh, you know uh, variables like intelligence and uh, sociopolitical views and uh, your profession or commitments to it, the kind of uh, decide very narrowly or they influence heavily of who you mingle with. And I see yes. that a lot in my professional life. And it can it can I mean, either the distance can be maintained lifelong or the other way. Is. So I think. Uh, <laughs> A lot of people stay away and they kind of they check sadistic pleasure in not mingling simply because it is the values that they hold very strongly and it kind of. So, how you would like to respond to that? Uh, it, uh, yes, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, that really is the message of the seven pillars of, of friendship. Um, they um, really do seem to dictate very strongly our, our kind of likes and dislikes. The bad side, of course, is it leads to echo chambers uh, and silos, uh, silos within organizations very quickly, um, um, often for administrative reasons, but, you know, it, it reinforces them. Um, so there is a downside to that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the positive side of it is that if your friends are more similar to you, then somehow those relationships or the interactions of those people are more enjoyable because you don't have to work so hard at it. You don't have to be spend so much nervous energy wondering what shall I say next? If I say this, will, will I offend the person or will I look stupid? You know, you, you know that your friends don't mind if you uh, offend them or they don't mind if you look stupid. They just go, oh, he always says that. <laughs> Um, you know, so so it's that distinction between you know the, that small set of relationships that work easily for us uh, and those that don't. But these these, as a consequence, 
these things then do have knock-on consequences for how relationships work within organizations. And that's a big, big topic in itself. And particularly, you know, if you look at the structure oh. of universities, I'm sure administration and, and departments, you'll see very similar pictures. Uh, I you know, often wonder, for example, these uh, emails that people write, uh, <coughs> sort of mass emails. And I, I often actually go predicting around who should be actually you know, the number of people that he must have addressed. And exactly, you know, my, my intuition is correct. It doesn't involve yes. at all anybody with a different point of view at all. So they are the same set of people that, yeah. that the email is sent. And when somebody kind of remarks uh, on, on, on any, anywhere in one of the emails, nobody responds. So yes. it's, it's very yes. predictable phenomena yes. that what guides yes. these people in the first place to write a mass email, whatever may be the, uh, whatever yeah. the point may be. And the number of people it would certainly go to. So uh, yeah. it has become but, some sort of, yeah. Yeah, this, I think this is the difference between Twitter and let's say social media like Facebook, you know, that, that's a bit more focused, a little bit more focused. And that Twitter is like a light, I was thinking of it as a lighthouse. So, you know, there are, I'm sure people in the university who just send out mass emails to everybody um, and nobody reads them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you see the, if you see an email coming from somebody you think is important, maybe, or is a, is a friend or will have something interesting to say, then you'll read that. And it, this, this is borne out really by um, an analysis we did of citation patterns among scientists. So we showed that, um, I don't know, she was co-author patterns rather than citation patterns, who, who people co-author papers with. And we showed that... Um, uh, the number of co-authors that a scientist had correlates with their productivity and uh, uh, also that the number uh, uh, of co-authors they had was a higher proportion of their total social network if, the more, if they were successful. In other words, I'm sorry to have to tell you that at least for scientists, <laughs> uh, successful scientists are boring people that only talk to other successful scientists. I think you wrote about an article uh, what it takes to be to, to remain on the top or something of that sort. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, so uh, yeah. the other question that you know, uh, which is very general, it's 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 a uh, it, like. Uh, social media and uh, other uh, things that have expanded the manner in which we can communicate, but apparently people find themselves more lonelier, uh, all that they communicate about. Um, uh, it's as if, and many technology commentators and many books uh, yeah. kind of uh, make, they make us feel guilty that we are not yeah. any better, although we have all these you know, communications and texts and chats. So yeah. what, what uh, is this some, some evolutionary uh, 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 paradox that we have to solve as we get well on board. Well, I, I think it's a big paradox for us in the modern world in particular, uh, where we, you know, urban environments make it much more difficult for people to find and make friends very often. I mean, especially so in the West. You know, it's a big plague. It's, it's a much bigger plague, lonely, loneliness, both for young people and for old people, um, than COVID ever was or could be, really. It's been there. Uh, the last few decades that people have recognized this is a big problem. Um, uh, and it, you know, it, it's a consequence partly of opportunities, I think. So in order to meet and make friends with people, you need to know where to go and you need to know what people want to talk about. So you need to have some knowledge, if you like some cultural knowledge of what it is that is the, you know, the current interests of, of your cohort of generation of, of, of people. Um, but first, of course, you've got to find the places where they where they meet. And these are often very difficult, particularly for young graduates moving to another city where they don't know anybody. The only people they know are people at work, maybe. And they already have friends. You know, it's very difficult to, you know, you, to make a friend with somebody. You have to find somebody who also wants a friend <laughs> and is pre therefore prepared to give you time. If you go and try and be a friend of somebody who has already got a full address book and all their time is already busily spent uh, uh, you know, with their, their friends and family, they, can't, they can only fit you in if they drop somebody else. Yeah. Um, and that actually does happen. We showed that happens with romantic relationships. Romantic relationships are very expensive for you. You have to sacrifice one friend because a romantic relationship in that, that, in that one and a half circle right in the center takes up a lot of time. <laughs> so... 
Uh, also, I have uh, been intrigued by you know, social phenomena in some cultures like the Japanese, who have preferred, many of them, to stay away from all sorts of uh, human contact, and many of them have preferred, basically, the life of the single, and not referring particularly to the concept of marriage, but certainly they, they have preferred about 50% of the world, and many also in Scandinavian countries. What could be, I mean, they are well off, they're, they're certainly more technical than us, but what could be, how could you, uh, uh, you know, uh, why this is and how to really explain this? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, I, you know, th these are sort of, if you like, these are not peculiar conditions uh, to those particular places. Uh, it's just that they seem to occur more often there, maybe, is the thing. Um, I, I think the, in other words, in any population, you will find people who have fewer friends and people who feel lonely. Um, and that kind of refers back in a way to one of the endogenous bases for homophily, and that is uh, personality. So the difference between introverts and extroverts. So what we find in our data, uh, and indeed other people have found, is that introverts, as you might expect, have fewer friends and family. If you ask them to list out, they probably could come out about 100 people maybe, whereas extroverts will have many more. They might list out 200, 250 people. The difference between them is that how they allocate their time, because the constraint is that both introverts and extroverts have the same social capital, that's to say time available for uh, giving to other people. Ex extroverts appear to prefer to have more friends but give each one less time and therefore have weaker mm -hmm. relationships. Whereas introverts are kind of risk averse, they prefer to have fewer friends, be able to give each one more time and therefore have a stronger relationship with each one and therefore more reliable friendship. Um, and, you know, that's fine. You know, that's part of the natural uh, distribution of personalities. But like all these bell-shaped curves in, in psychology and biology, you know, it means that some people will be right down at the bottom end. And, and, and for some reason, you know, they may not just enjoy the social world. They may prefer to live on, on their own completely um, and sit on top of a mountain somewhere or on a desert, a, 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 an island in, in the ocean. And they're very contented with their lives in some, some of these cases. Um, or they may just not be very good at making friends with people. And, and we found that in one data set for, um, uh, from an English village here that we collected, uh, um, women in particular who scored high on the neuroticism personality scale, so they're not clinically neurotic, it, it's, they're anxious more than anything else, had much smaller social networks, and particularly they had very few female relatives in their network. And I think that's because or I suspect that's because what they've done is they've, they're so anxious, they're constantly wanting uh, uh, to seek people's advice or, or to have help or whatever, and they get, have gone around bothering people, and especially their female relatives, because they're always the most generous to you. Um, so much that finally even their female relatives have said, look, enough, I don't want to see you again. Don't bother me, you know, which is very bad news because your female family members are the cavalry you know when they're the last person comes to you to help you out when things are bad that is who the cavalry is you know everybody else will abandon you they will still come and if they too have given up um that's that's uh, um doesn't bode well for, for the future i think so but it's a, an example of how social skills if you like may then become important in allowing you to manage relationships because relationships are extremely difficult to manage uh, at the end of the day. That's why we have a big brain. I think it's completely, uh, uh, you know, an acceptable theory that we evolve to sort of offload uh, the contents of our perceptions yep. of consciousness to other brains. And better if they're in the vicinity and we have embodied relations with them. So one example that comes, you know, people who serve very long prison sentences, like 30, 40 years, 50 yes. years. Yes. Apparently, they, they seem to be pretty content, even though they meet one another maybe for one hour or so, but, and mm -hmm. most of the time they're in their other cells. I, I mean, this yep. is a very specific population, but yep. 
you can call them, uh, you know, they have been kept in that way so that they, they yeah. are out of the societal stimulation. But apparently the, the, the more is that they live pretty well. I mean, they, they kind yes. of don't feel that bad. Why, yeah. why so? Is this, I, I, I think it's just adaptation, if you like, that you can adjust to your circumstances, whether you're always as happy. I don't know, maybe, maybe even those of us who have friends are sometimes unhappy about our friends. <laughs> Uh, so it's, friends are not always necessarily um, uh, uh, um, uh, nirvana, if you like. They're, they can be very annoying or they can upset you. But maybe I, I suspect that people who have very prolonged periods of isolation like that just become adapted to it and they lose their social skills a little bit. There is some evidence from the lockdown from COVID that uh, people... Um, uh, felt kind of at least certain age groups anyway particularly older people perhaps a little unsure about how to renew old friendships once they came we came out of lockdown because they they had such a long period where they didn't see um some of their friends again um and, and by the same token actually the, the the data are very very clear i think from covid because they show that women experience much greater uh negative effects from not seeing their friends than men did and, and and this seems to bear back to very striking gender difference that women's friendships are much much more um focused and personalized it matters who you are um uh not what you do whereas men men's friendships tend to be more casual and club-like it's more important that you're a member of the club whatever that club might be um than who you are as an individual so their relationships, are, I suppose you might say, even more shallow from that point of view, and therefore uh, less easily disrupted if you get something like lockdown. So, but the data are very clear from lockdown. Women found it much, much harder because they, their pattern of meeting with their, their close friends, particularly their close women friends, was very badly disrupted by it. Whereas, whereas the guys just went, oh, you know, okay, uh, I'll just watch another film on TV. <laughs> yeah, one last, uh, it's sort of, a, it, you know, the, the loneliness uh, ratio is increasing or in all kinds of cities and although we have more access to, to meet one another and, you know, apps and so on and so forth. Apparently people still, even if, even if they have a very strong social life, many, many, many adults, Apparently, it's like some very typical romantic relationship, as if something remains very seriously unfulfilled. And they don't, they, they make a theoretical distinction between the so called the friend zone, I'm okay, but I'm not that happy. And if other people have romantic relationships, then alienation increases. It's, is it a very typical primate? Uh, you know, have you, have you got the evidence that other primates do have that kind of a thing? Like they feel very lonely, they don't have that type of very meaningful, whatever. You know, all these personality columns and advice columns, they're like, okay, you need both. But why can't we just be content with the way you're describing? And I have 10 friends and I have, you know, I, I spend my time pretty well and I exchange my ideas, but I don't have a romantic relationship, typically. So why don't we just right. suffer? Uh, I, th I think that's because of the peculiarity of, of human romantic, the way human romantic relationships are organized. Um, in these very tight pair bonds. It's not to say necessarily the pair bond lasts for a lifetime, but they're very, they do last for quite a long time. There's no question about that. And they're very, very intense. And that tends to uh, create an opposition between inside and outside. And, and for better or for worse, uh, a lot of our community bonding mechanisms, which build on the seven pillars of friendship, in a, in a very important way. So if you look at the pillars of friendship, you know, not only do they regulate our friendships at the individual level, my friendship with you is a consequence of the fact that we share certain ways of thinking, certain preferences for music, we prefer certain jokes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or we're born in the same village. Oh, we might not have been lived there at the same time, but you know, you know the coffee bars I know, it's the same coffee bars, yes, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. We had fun there when we were <laughs> teenagers yeah. too. You know, it's those kind of things um, become important. Uh, 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 they're all kind of 
based on a kind of creating a sense of an in-group versus the out-group out there that we're trying to protect ourselves against. Of course, religion works particularly well uh, in doing that, uh, for better or for worse. Um, but that kind of natural in-group versus out-group division just seems to uh, run through the whole system. And that's because our time is limited. You know, I've only got two or three hours in the day that I can devote to social interaction. I have to choose. Do I spend it with you? Uh, or do I spend it with uh, somebody else down the road, you know, and uh, you're more fun, so I come with you. Uh, and then, you know, the third person down the road gets offended by both of us <laughs> because we didn't invite them, you know. Um, and so by the same token, as you go into that inner circle at one and a half, um, uh, that, uh, that one and a half, by the way, is a consequence of the fact that men well, women tend to have both a romantic partner and a best friend forever. It's usually a, another woman, not always, but usually another woman. And men have one or the other, but not both, it seems. Uh, right. And so the average yeah. end is the one and a half. Now that, you know, that is so costly that that relationship. You spend so much time, devote so much time to that person that it forces you away from your, the time you should dev devote to the other people. And so, you know, quite literally, we, we, we've shown with uh, romantic relationships, when people have a new romantic relationship, investing very heavily in that relationship, they devote much less time to uh, two other people in their uh, inner core of five. And effectively, they sacrifice them. And they, those two people drop down into the next layer out, 15 layers. So people who are in an active romantic relationship only have four uh, a circle of four best friends instead of five best friends. So romance is very costly. It costs you two friends. So I think well, that's... that's a, <laughs> I think that's, that's a very meaningful uh, suggestion for what we've done. But I think I would now open up the discussion with a couple okay. of questions and comments from the audience okay. to provide and be kindly be specific. Uh, we can fix it up. Um, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead and be specific. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, reflecting on something that you mentioned during your presentation, that uh, we are more likely to connect and more likely to be uh, friends with people who share similar personalities to us. And uh, I think I have to agree to that because many of my friends also share at least some version of me. But it makes me wonder, are we innately self-centered then that we tend to look for ourselves within our friendships as well? And that kind of contradicts the whole idea of human beings being social animals. Um, yep, uh, it's a very good question, actually. Um, the answer, the short answer is, I think this, all these homophily effects are due to the fact that it just makes it easier to have a close relationship with them or a relationship at a specific level. It's because you, <clears throat> you know how they think. I mean, this really is the village phenomenon. You know everybody in the village. You understand how they think. You know that old Mrs. So-and-so is always a bit cross with the children uh, uh, when your children go and, 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 and misbehave. Uh, you know that, you know, down the road, granny, granny, somebody else is always very generous and gives them sweeties and all these kind of things. You just understand the dynamics of, of, of the village, if you like. Um, so I think that's the important thing, because what's important about friendships is having them there not just for going to parties with or, or going, uh, you know, to have a, a coffee somewhere or something like that, but, and, and a conversation, but when your world falls apart and you need some help to lift you back up, or perhaps if you have a difficulty, uh, you need to borrow some money off somebody, um, they will say yes. It's having them there as your kind of protection. Um, and those relationships then have to work at this level of intimacy, because the only reason they're going to help you out is if they have this trust in you, and that will depend on you spending a lot of time with them uh, and them with you. So I think that's the essence of it. It's, it. And the problem is, if you like, is that our natural grouping patterns are these very small communities. If you look at hunter-gatherer societies or small-scale traditional societies, 
uh, that live in villages, agricultural societies, this is the typical size of their villages. Um, uh, they, they don't really have mechanisms for making very large groupings because most of these people they don't see very often. You know, the, they, there is a level for the tribe, yes, but you know, most of these people you, you don't see you know, from one year to the next year. Um, uh, and all you need to know is that they belong to the same tribe as you, and you know that the moment they say hello, because of the way they say hello, right? They know the words you know. Um, uh, so, so, you know, that focus, I think, has created this mindset that we have built in of, of just have, having these small number of people uh, in our social world that that really work very well, and outside that, it really doesn't matter too much. Um, uh, and and that in turn then creates it's fine in, in small scale societies because that's how the geography of the society is that works well. But when we live in big cities, you know, ten million people, like you know, there might be in Mumbai these days, or Tokyo, or London, or somewhere like that. Um, you know, most of these people you, are anonymous. We don't know who they are. We'll never meet them, uh, except by chance. Um, and um, at that point, it starts to become worse because I think it creates inward, more inward-lookingness because you look for protection to the people you know well within within your local area, um, and that tends to create silos uh, and and echo chambers very quickly. So I think that's why you get it on. On, on social media in particular is a big problem. Um, but it's also a big problem in organizations. It's the biggest problem that most big multinational companies have to deal with is the fact that you end up with silos all over the place, not just between different offices, but within each office, because um, uh, you know there are just too, too many people. Um, and, and that is the problem because all the evidence points to the fact that diversity actually is very good. Cognitive diversity is very good for generating new ideas. And we showed it with our, um, our longitudinal high, uh, senior school study going to university, because uh, they have personality data for everybody. We showed that having a mixture of personalities improved, dramatically improved the efficiency with which information flowed around the network because extroverts acted like bridges between subgroups of introverts, um, providing the links between them. And so that allowed information to flow. This is a modeling exercise using the, the values uh, parameterized from, from the, uh, the, the, the actual data. Um, and, but also it's been shown in, in um, uh, business organization studies that you know, if you have a group of people who Come from different backgrounds then they're much more likely to generate new ideas more quickly than, than people who all have the same perspective so it's good and bad as the, the truth is in real life in biology and i dare say in psychology there's no such thing as perfection there's variation and variation is a good thing <laughs> thank you any other questions from the audience uh, hello, I, I have a question. So first of all, thank you for the talk. It has, I think I've, I've been thinking since you stopped uh, your presentation. So I have two questions. One, uh, first question is that you mentioned there are gender biases in the way we make friends. And you also mentioned that the way women, females interact with their friends and males interact is different. Uh, what I want to know, why do you think that is so? Like what is inherently different between men and women in the way they make friends? Uh, social style is the bottom end. Um, this operates at the behavioral end. So if you look at what, well, first of all, it, it, it's true at the structural end. So again, as I mentioned, um, women have this phenomenon of a best friend forever, which appears to be an alien concept for most men. If you ask a man, do you have a best male friend? He will think and he'll go, mm, yeah, well, so and so <laughs> but if you look at the nature of that relationship it is not the same quality of relationship as if you ask a woman who is your best friend your best friend forever and, 
Um, that 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 in in her case, it's a very intimate relationship. You know, it's a relationship of secrets and stuff, and uh, and it's sort of confidences and, and things like this. Um, and it has much. It's a very intense relationship, rather like a romantic relationship, but of a platonic nature. Is the best way of maybe describe. And those kind of relations are kind of unknown, really, for in general for boys. Not to say that you don't sometimes find them. It's just that you know, typically, it's kind of extremely rare. Um, if you look at what makes relationships work, um, then for girls' relationships, we've shown that what makes the relationship persist over time is the amount of time they invest in talking to each other and conversation, essentially. Uh, it's very, girls' relationships are very conversation-based. Um, uh, whereas if you look at boys' relationship, the amount of conversation has absolutely zero effect on whether a relationship will last or not. And it doesn't matter whether the other person is a male or a female. What makes the difference to boys' relationships is activities, doing stuff together. Right. So it doesn't matter what the activity is, it might be going out on a Saturday night round the town, doing whatever boys do round the town, riding their motorbikes or, you know, these kind of things, playing football together, soccer together uh, regularly, climbing mountains together regularly, you name it, but it's an activity based thing. Um, and activities, remember, are very good at triggering the endorphin system. Um, uh, and they tend to be less contact based as well. Uh, women's relationships are much more kind of involve much more con physical contact. And again, that's triggering the endorphin system, of course. Um, if, uh, if you look at the bits of the brain that are involved, they're often, often also likewise operating in different places. And one of the things we've shown is that women are much better at integrating their romantic relationships, their general friendships, and the network, the social network, than men are. Uh, so um, that makes them much better at deciding whether doing something is a good thing or not for the wider network of their relationships, whereas men seem to be much poorer at that. Um, I, I, to put it in very crude terms, very simple cartoon terms, uh, women think first and act afterwards, and men act first and think afterwards, and by which time it's too late. They've already do, done something that's uh, upset granny, upset uh, the community, <laughs> upset their best friends, upset their romantic partners or something. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, these are very, very subtle differences. And I think they they have been kind of overlooked in this whole literature because the whole gender differences literature has been focused on intelligence, which is completely irrelevant because there aren't any differences between the sexes. But at the social level, it's becoming increasingly clear that the differences are enormous. And we can ask interesting questions why that should be. I don't think we really know. I can give you some speculations if you like about the evolutionary history of relationships in humans but um, um th there are and again it, it it kind of this is very clear in romantic relationships in this context as well because it's clear that women make up their minds very early on whether they like this boy or not and often the boy doesn't even under realize that and the girl has to keep ringing him up keep knocking on his door sending him letters and stuff. And eventually even the most stupid boy goes, oh, hang on a minute, this is interesting. <laughs> and gets uh, uh, and, and says, oh yeah, okay. Um, but it can take a very long time. So we, we've looked, used mobile phone data to show this in fact, and, uh, and they keep those, that pattern going much longer than, than, than boys do that focus. Um, uh, um, and that goes back again to this difference between the sexes, between this sense of women's, Friendships are very focused and personalized. It really matters who you are as an individual. Whereas boys, friendships are much more casual in this sense. And so they kind of don't process in, in great detail the, the, the social context of relationships. But I can only tell you from my point of view, you know, I can give you the boys picture <laughs> and what I observe. 
observing humans. Um, and uh, you, you can tell me if this matches the girl's view of, uh, uh, of, of this very uh, weird and extraordinary social world that we live in. Because uh, oh, that's one of the, <laughs> this, I was just going to say, this is one of the big difficulties, you know, it's very easy. And if you look at the literature, I think the literature on this whole area uh, on gender differences is completely flawed by the fact that whoever says anything, everything they say is coming from the perspective of either a girl or a boy's view. Um, unfortunately, it's extremely difficult for us to kind of negotiate both at the same time. Um, I don't know how you do it. I don't even know whether that's possible, but uh, um, uh, you know, there, there must be there must be a course here some, somewhere, Professor, for, for training better social psychologists to have a wider perspective. Oh. <laughs> uh I was thinking about Joe Biden and Obama. I think this kind of as outliers, uh, as men, men, you know, they yes. probably, you know, it, 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 it just probably be media gimmick. I think there must be some truth in, uh, yeah. as of the number yeah. of hours they must have talked to one another yeah. for yeah, eight yeah. years. And yes. the other, yes. I'll give you one small example of how, you know, in Indian marriages where a lot of people gather, men, women, children, the men apparently begin to talk to one another in one room. There may be some alcohol. Yes. Then women come and they ask, what, are, what is it that you are all talking? So they, as if, are so suspicious, what is it that they're talking? And yeah. then they kind of intrude. But the men have no guess what to do, what the women are talking. It's, yeah. it's obvious. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of, they, they, they begin as if they would maintain that sort of a coherence throughout the day. Yeah. But yeah. it's broken within an hour, in, in some time. So yeah. that, and, and it's a very, very clear thing you can see. Uh, uh, children don't disturb a lot. They, they, yeah. they do their stuff. But a woman will come, you know, they, they kind of uh, become, uh, what is the content of the discourse? Yes. That is men yeah. are on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, that's a very interesting observation, actually, because we've done quite a lot of work on um, gender segregation in conversations. If you watch conversations at a big party, like a wedding where you have lots of people or a reception or something like that, then, or even just in a, in a, a social gathering in a bar or a club or something of that kind or a coffee bar, um, what you find very, very quickly is the two sexes segregate out. The women talk together, the men talk together. It seems to be universal everywhere. We've looked at it in uh, Iran, for example, with some collaborators. We've looked at it in, in, in the UK and other parts of Europe. Um, if there's less than four people in a conversation, everybody stays together, it doesn't matter the sex makeup, gender makeup. If you get more than four people in the social group, it will separate out into two uh, gender specific conversations. But then the number of times that I've had people comment that where you have husband and wife, for example, at a dinner party with some friends, so there may be three or four couples there, and they will all be sitting around listening to the same conversation. And when they get home, the wife says, now wasn't it very interesting that, um, uh, 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 Susan said that, you know, her children or her grandchildren or this or her aunties or something like this. And her husband who heard the same conversation goes, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> they're processing, processing different, you know, processing the same input, perceptual input, the conversation in different ways in terms of the way their social world is organized. So, you know, it's not necessarily the guys are only paying attention to, you know, sort of politics or, um, um, uh, I don't know, the, the technology of uh, motor cars or, you know, how to play golf better, these kind of things. Um, uh, 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 they actually seem to be processing the content of the conversation in terms of a different social world in this context. Oh, so it makes you, you <laughs> I was going to say, it makes you wonder then how men and women talk together. Ask and our, da way. our data shows very clearly what the women do is adjust to what the men, how the men are talking. Um, if uh, I, I would like your advice, if you are planning an evening party and you have been, <laughs> you have been depressed or sort of, uh, you have convinced yourself that how many men and women should you invite? Let's consider uh, that kind of affluent, they have money and everything, but what should be Joshua. the number? Yeah. 
I, I think you've got two options. You, are, you either want to have a small group of the same sex because it will work better, better together, or you could have a bigger group of mixed sexes, so there's couples, right? Um, but if you really want it to work better and to lift you, there are two things, ways of doing this in particular, I think. One is to have a lot of laughter, and the other is singing. Dancing is okay, but, you know, we kind of tend to have uh, dancing with couples, you know, or some, some kind of form like that. It, you know, dancing kind of very easily gravitates into, to, into couple format, whereas singing, everybody joins in. And what's interesting about this, we've only just discovered this, is the male and female voices are exactly an octave apart. And that means they can sing in harmony with each other and singing in harmony kicks the endorphin system massively uh, and creates this sense of bonding so i'm very much in favor of of, of singing together um it, but if you can't sing then laughter is 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 the best thing or I'm actually sure. just 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 going walking is quite good you know walking oh. in the hills the exercise triggers the endorphin system yeah so i think we put the just be continuing like this, but I think what we've done also in it. Uh, well, any, any one last uh, comment? For you, I, I urge you that more than what we have talked here, you'll find a lot in his writings. So do go and check out his books and articles and please contact him for any, uh, any information you may want. And sure. I'm quite sure that we, act, at least in mind brain sciences in India, we need evolutionary psychology in a big way, which has no grounding whatsoever. It, all these five ten departments. So this is my empirical observation. So we need to start this in a big way, and it has not happened actually. We have all these traditional fields, that's fine, but we don't have, don't have a culture of uh, getting that, diving deep into this broad question, uh, the, the the very very important question. So I think this should encourage a lot of students who are here to consider taking up specializations and finding out more how they can do more uh, or at least incorporate some of these ideas um, into their work. Any other last one? There is some sort, there's a question in the uh, endorphin on endorphin solidarity. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. Yeah, I saw something in the chat box, but I couldn't read it, so. Can you please comment something on solidarity building and social movements, the role of endorphins? Uh, okay, the role of endorphins in what kinds of context? I didn't quite get it. In, 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 build, in building solidarity. Oh, in building solidarity. Okay, so all the things we do that create this sense of bonding and belonging are things that trigger the endorphin system. So these are, as I mentioned just now, things like laughter and singing, but also dancing, uh, telling stories, storytelling, the very important part, both because funny stories and emotional stories, like tragedies, trigger the endorphin system directly, but also storytelling is part of the seven pillars, creates a sense of you know, uh, belonging to the same community, we know the same thing. So all these things and the rituals of religion, this is why religion works so well, I think, um, generally. Um, uh, the, the, you know, any of these things are turn out, well, they, they evolve to create smallish scale communities, but they, most of them work very well for creating large scale communities and very often on their own. So I think the classic case is religion which seems to work extremely well at creating a kind of mega community uh, because it engages in this you know rituals that trigger the endorphin system um, uh, uh, um, there are stories in there very often stories of tragedy and triumph over tragedy think of all the classic stories at the foundation of all the big religions hinduism uh, uh, um, uh, Buddhism, uh, you know, they're all triumphs of, of, of if you like, the founders of, over um, uh, conflict and difficulty and what have you. Islam, uh, the same. Christianity, the same. Um, uh, and also, you know, they have have the, you know, they all have these um, 
sacred texts which create this sense of belonging to a community. Um, and so, you know, that appears to be part of the secret of the, the, their success, uh, particularly. Um, but it's, it's just exploiting, if you like, you know, one of or two of the seven pillars um, it, in a way which can be done with very, very large numbers of people without having to physically actually have them there with you at the time. Okay, I think we should... Uh... So close here. Okay. And, uh, I think we almost got quite a good picture of why friendships matter and uh, why it is cherished across cultures. Although the, the modern technological world that we live in and uh, they have put some constraints, but I think uh, this is a evolutionary need. And many of our activities, whether they are social, commercial, or linked to this desire to be with others. And that's what is the field of social cognition. A social cognitive neuroscience now, uh, which yes. has devoted journals, uh, Royal Society journals, where Professor Dunbar has published a lot human nature. So it is a big deal. And it kind of impacts us, starting with childhood, infancy to adulthood, the way we perceive our own lives, the narrative that we get over ourselves. Um, I think I would like to thank uh, Professor Dunbar for some for his time. And it was a pleasure to talk to you. And probably we will do something in India in person. And yes. we would have the good fortune of having you here. Uh, and that time is coming, thankfully. Uh, it is opening up. And uh, people are beginning to travel. Um, we will, uh, because we are trying to start actually something in evolution psychology. So uh, you would be a very sought after person to be in touch with. Uh, so, and I would like to thank Ashwini for the logistics, which is not very easy, actually, uh, even though it is virtual, and she uh, did a lot of work, and Vaishnavi Amora and other students who have done uh, also quite a bit in making this uh, uh, a very lively. So, and I thank all the students and others from other institutes who have been joining us. So, with these words, I would uh, thank everyone. And it would be posted on the University of Hyderabad's website. And a brief report also we publish on the university's newsletter. Um, kind of important questions and the answers for everyone to read who could yep. participate. So thank you all. Well, thank, thank you to the students for organizing it. And uh, a, a great job they've done too.